Yeah. You talk about a person being self-serving. Mr. Embry probably is the biggest self-server in, in, in the city of London because he wants it all his way. Like, you know, whatever Mark Embry wants, why, that's fine. I mean, you should have the free... But the Sunday shopping battle had a personal cost for Emery. I think I got tired of always being just a small segment of his life. Everything else just seemed to be so much more important. And I got tired of that after, well, seven years. I figured that was a long time. I was an inadequate husband. I was an inadequate parent because I was using so much of my money, so much of my time for these noble causes. And this has always been a concern, is that my family life suffers to the degree that I have to invest time and money in these things. And so the pursuit of justice is a, a double-edged sword because you end up cutting yourself off from other things that are very valuable to you, like your family. In 1988, Chrysler and Emery broke up. Sunday shopping would eventually come to London, along with the rest of Ontario. But Emery wouldn't take any comfort in that. He would later tell a reporter he hadn't accomplished anything on the issue. And this is where Mark often tended to lose his perspective, I think. I think uh, Mark often used to put down his own successes and wasn't satisfied with them, even though a lot of the early activity he instigated is still producing success today. He just refuses to recognize it. And through foggy London town, the sun was shining. Yeehaw! And good afternoon, London, Ontario. This is Radio Desert Storm, and we're welcoming all you air jockeys out there and you B-52 space cowboys who patrol the airways, protecting us from their mean, miserable Iraqis. Whoa, dude. In the late summer of 1990, Emery was offered the Thursday afternoon drive-home slot on CHRW, the radio station of the University of Western Ontario. The program, called Radio Free Speech, would help to vault Emery into international headlines. It's kill for peace, and that's what we want, don't we? More of that. So what was supposed to be, as I mentioned, an open format music program concentrating on uh, music, new and Canadian, suddenly became uh, a commentary type of program where he would play uh, a song or two and then five or ten minutes of commentary and then maybe a couple more songs to more commentary. See what happened when they gave me a show, I was a nice guy. And as I learned more about the power of the media, I decided that we were going to really make a statement on this show. So I criticized everything. I routinely criticize all the media in London as the layabouts they are, lazy, decadent, uninformed, and rather uncaring journalists who are just making a paycheck and giving people as inoffensive and, and unstimulating uh, material as possible. And I would criticize everybody. I criticized the Gulf War. I mean, I was vicious. It was a vicious show. There wasn't much preparation, really. It was pretty much uh, ad-libbing. Most of the phone calls were really positive. Um, we'd only get maybe a, a negative. You guys are terrible. I want you off the air every two weeks or so. But unfortunately, that's the kind that the station manager takes notice of. Mark seemed to have uh, to make light of of subjects and uh, seemed to think that he could champion anything. And and by that, we had made it quite clear that the use of profanities on the air, uh, name calling of uh, members living in the community would get us into serious trouble, uh, either a lawsuit or uh, having our license revoked. And his uh, pat answer was, well, I'll, uh, I will pay for a lawyer. I don't know much about it myself, but here at Radio Desert Storm, we, uh, we're, we're a free democratic radio station. We got an open mind here, and if you don't open it, we'll bomb the hell out of you and kill you. <laughs> One of the recordings Emery featured on his program was Nasty As They Wanna Be by the American rap group Two Live Crew. It had the distinction of being the first recording to be banned in Canada because of its lyrics. They contain references to female and male sexual organs, sadomasochism, forceful sexual intercourse, and the sounds of moaning, among other things. I mean, that's stupid. I mean, how, how could I even take seriously? I mean, the courts, I mean, the court, the court system is just so laughable. I mean, I mean, obviously, I have complete contempt for it, and, and every time I go to court, I learn another reason why it has no validity, and ultimately... Emery announced to everyone, including the police, that he would sell the banned cassette. Any record store that was previously handling this tape, and there were four or five, um, have had visits by the police, and they've been told, in no uncertain words, that they will be charged if they 
uh, continue to handle it. So consequently, all four record stores that did handle it withdrew it from sale. And I find that's police intimidation, and that's unacceptable in a free society. Emery sold the recording to about 40 customers. One was an undercover police officer. Emery was served with a summons, and his store was searched. Emery and his lawyer declared the criminal code violated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because it was needlessly vague. When the judge refused to hear the evidence, Emery argued rap music was a unique reflection of black culture. The judge rejected that defense, claiming two live crew represented American, not Canadian, black culture. Emery was found guilty and put on 12 months probation. I've never met a sympathetic judge ever. Um, most judges are old, tired, cowardly old fogies, you know, that represent everything that's disgusting about our system. They should be dead and in a grave long before, you know, they just sit in the court benches way too long. You know, they say age, you accrue wisdom with age. These people just get hemorrhoids. They don't... For the delay, while Sarajevo but as the trial heated up, some people became concerned that Emery was drifting away from his role as a political hours. activist and becoming something else, a media hog. I think the whole relationship between Mark Emery and the media was one that um, allowed Mark to get his points out. I don't think Mark needed the media to survive. I don't think he was, you know, he sort of <clears throat> blew himself up or pu puffed himself up because he appeared in the media because he was, you know, that wasn't the type of person he was. Uh, no, I think that Mark knew how to use the media. I think the media knew how to use Mark uh, for various reasons. And, and, you know, I don't think the greatest one was for publicity or to sell newspapers. I don't think I use the word megalomaniac lightly. I think he started to feed off the effect he had on people. He started to feed off the attention and just had to turn it up and up and up. I mean, I think in a really immature, emotional, uncontrollable for him kind of way, he fed off the response he got. A lot of people accuse Mark of being such a, an exhibitionist, you know, just to, for, um, you know, he likes to have attention. but. It was all directed towards a cause rather than, you know, just, you know, see how great I am. You know, I'm, I'm Mark the Great. Mark Emery is, is very much a media creation. Um, I mean, frankly, I'm not sure why I'm taking part in this interview because in a way I'm simply helping to, to build the, the Mark Emery media myth. He's someone who has become very adept at manipulating the media, something which one must concede isn't all that difficult anyway. Ultimately, I'm a publicity seeker because unlike most Canadians, I think I have something to say. I actually think that I can say it properly and, and, and with a degree of context that makes me understood above the rabble of totally uh, inarticulate nabobs that are going around spouting these stupid ideas that permeate our society. I'm about the only person you can nearly understand. At but the while end of the Emery day, was courting one form of publicity, he was destroying another. On the Atheist Easter weekend special, Here's another one we've got piles of them, so just stay right tuned. When I was five years it is. Old, I walked out call of us at 661-3600 if you're offended. I'm in the mood for an argument, so give us a call. I recall a comment that came from a long-standing volunteer here at CHRW who said, uh, allowing Mark Emery on the radio station is like uh, putting a drunk driver behind the wheel of an automobile. Mark's way of dealing with it wasn't always conducive, and in fact, he once again shocked people to the degree that he lost that opportunity, rather than having rejoiced in the victory of the fact that he had this tool at his disposal. He used it to shock people until they took the tool away from him.